All right. Well, I want to welcome everyone to the IFAM seminar series. Um, this is a series that is conducted every Thursday at noon. So please tune in if this is your first time. Uh, we will put a list of the upcoming ones at the end in the chat. Uh, so please do join us um, if any of the topics are relevant or interesting to you. All right, so today I have the great pleasure of introducing my dear colleague, Dr. Christopher Warren, uh, and he is going to be talking to us about understanding and addressing the public health burden of food allergy. Now, I have known Chris uh, for a decade now. Um, he went to Northwestern, he came uh, to us as a research assistant after college or after he went away and then came back and came to us as a research assistant, worked with us for a couple of years, and then went on to uh, get his doctorate at USC Keck School of Medicine Department of Population and Public Health Sciences. Uh, and that was in 2019. And after that, he went on to Stanford at the Sean Parker Center to complete his postdoc. And we were able to pull him back to Chicago, to Northwestern, and he has now joined us as faculty as Assistant Professor of Preventative Medicine and Director of Population Health at our Northwestern's um, CIFAR, the Center for Food Allergy and Asthma Research. And he focuses his research on um, ameliorating the burden of food allergy via large-scale epidemiological studies and behavioral interventions. Uh, he has been working in the food allergy space till 2011, and although he's traveled the country getting his degrees, um, he has continued in the space and continued to partner with us um, to the point where he has, I think, almost 70 um, publications now. So he is uh, uh, amazing. I, I, there's very little I can, um, I, I can continue to talk about him for the whole hour, but I know he has a really important talk, uh, but I am so honored because um, he has just been a joy to work with and all of you who know him know that too. So I will stop there and let Chris take it away. Oh, well, thank you, Ruchi. I, I will try to, to do that introduction some justice. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, and as Ruchi alluded, my goal with this seminar is to provide kind of an overview of the US population level burden of food allergy uh, with an emphasis on uh, some of the work that, you know, Ruchi, myself, and our, our large and ever-growing team at CIFAR um, have been conducting for the past uh, 10 years. And hopefully we can talk about some, some stuff we have in the works as well. And so I figure a good place to start is just clarifying what I mean when I say food allergy, um, because there are a lot of different conditions that can result in adverse food reactions, including you know, those that aren't immune mediated, things like intolerances or, or food poisoning, which actually can resemble uh, food allergy in some contexts. Um, and then among those adverse food reactions that are immune mediated, only a subset are mediated through uh, IgE. And so uh, it's those guys in the bottom left. And when IgE is working properly, you know, it identifies triggers immediately upon exposure to the antigen. And when it's working properly, it, that's ideally a reaction to Hellman's parasites, because that's what uh, we think that this uh, system of allergy evolved to help us deal with. Um, however, as, as many of us know, IgE can sometimes react to specific proteins that actually don't pose a threat, um, like food and pollen, and that's an IgE-mediated food allergy. Um, one important aspect of IgE-mediated food allergy is that there are, uh, and, and allergy in general, is that there are two key phases. You know, there's the sensitization phase, where your immune system encounters a protein for the first time and then classifies it as something potentially harmful you know, to the host i.e. Uh, the patient. And then there's the effector phase, which is when your immune system is exposed to that allergenic protein again, and it mounts an immune response to try to expel or otherwise neutralize uh, the antigen. And that results in, in the uh, all too familiar clinical symptoms of allergy. And so here are some common IgE mediated food allergy symptoms. Um, and you can note that, that these symptoms include both Kind of localized cutaneous reactions, often in or around the mouth or, or wherever uh, has come in contact with the food, um, as well as systemic reactions, which can be uh, quite serious. And so since when a food is digested, you know, the proteins are absorbed into the bloodstream um, and goes all around the body, uh, there can be systemic involvement and these symptoms can occur uh, all over the body. 
and some more severe reactions that involve uh, multiple organ systems uh, we refer to as anaphylaxis and that can be uh, life-threatening if uh, and very occasionally fatal and unfortunately data suggests that rates of food induced anaphylaxis have been increasing here in the U.S. for some time um, and are also uh, increasing uh, globally as well. And as I alluded to, you know, while, while food allergy outcomes um, you know, can be severe and, and result in, in a lot of healthcare utilization, as, as we're going to talk about, fatalities are rare. You know? And so this is one review by our colleague Paul Turner in the UK, uh, which suggests that the annual incidence of fatal anaphylaxis you know, in, in the US general population um, that's people with and without food allergy, an unselected population, is likely about, you know, comparable to the odds of dying from a lightning strike. Um, however, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of food allergy fatalities do occur each year in the U.S. And even though they're rare, uh, data indicate that, you know, among patients and their parents' caregivers, this perceived risk of, uh, of mortality can be highly salient and can lead to high levels of stress, anxiety, social limitation, you know, in our society where, you know, food is everywhere, uh, you know, we eat when we celebrate, we eat when we mourn, we eat all the time, uh, we snack, uh, and then that ubiquity of food brings with it the fear of a potentially severe outcome for patients uh, trying to avoid common allergens. Um, and so we know that, you know, this, this whole dynamic often leads to reduced quality of life among food allergy patients and the people who care for them, um, especially uh, given the lack of, uh, you know, accessible FDA approved therapies and the fact that we, we can't really reliably stratify or, or determine, you know, who is it at greatest risk of suffering a severe reaction. Uh, so we manage most patients uh, similarly, you know, they avoid their, we instruct them to avoid their food, carry an epinephrine auto injector, and then train them in uh, how and when to use it. And we know that a lot of patients struggle to find that sweet spot between you know, being hyper vigilant and always on the lookout and stressed about about you know an anxiety around potential exposure to their allergen, and then the flip side, which is uh, being very laissez faire and uh, not maybe taking their allergy uh, seriously or into account, uh, which can also increase the risk of having a reaction. Um, and another important aspect of the kind of population level burden of food allergy is uh, is the economics. You know, these estimates that you see here are somewhat dated and about a decade old, um, but they're still the latest data we have regarding the economic burden of food allergy in the US. Uh, we, we don't have any data yet on the burden of adult food allergy, the economic burden of, of adult food allergy. Um, and these estimates are only for the pediatric population, you know, which as we know is only about a quarter of the whole US population. Um, uh, Dr. Balaver, uh, Lucy Balaver and our group um, and I and Ruchi and others are working to uh, re-administer an expanded version of this survey um, to assess the current economic impact of uh, a childhood and adult food allergy in the U.S. Um, to a large nationally representative sample of families uh, later this year. So stay tuned there. Um, but I do think it's important to kind of begin the talk by highlighting the, the physical, psychosocial and economic aspects of food allergy up front because as I start to present some of our food allergy prevalence data, uh, the numbers get so big that it's easy to lose perspective of the fact that, you know, when we talk about 32 million plus people living with food allergies, you know, these are individuals, each with their own journey. Um, and in most cases that involves their families, friends, and, and loved ones, um, you know, like this guy who uh, some of you guys might know. Um, and I feel obligated to, say if there are any of our undergrads or med students. So this is Charlie Brown, and this is a, from a comic strip called Peanuts. And in case there are any of our high schoolers watching, you know, this is a comic strip. It's kind of like a TikTok, but a little more primitive. It used to be published in the back of the newspaper. Um, anyway, I digress, but uh, I think this raises an issue of uh, the physician diagnosis of food allergy, um, because not everybody, uh, you know, who, who has a food allergy, you know, gets to sit in uh, Charlie's uh, position here. Um, and, and when trying to understand the population health burden of food allergies, you know, we, we sometimes use healthcare utilization and claims data um, to, to estimate the burden on the, the entire population. But particularly for food allergy, um, there's a weakness to that, which is that you know, those estimates do not do a good job of representing individuals who don't interact with the healthcare system, you know, either due to lack of access, poor insurance, 
um, or personal choice. You know, this is an important issue in food allergy because you know many people decide to kind of self-diagnose and manage their food allergies on their own. You know, and often choose to avoid a food rather than uh, getting confirmatory allergy testing, uh, which which we know can be costly and, and difficulty and difficult uh, to schedule um, because uh, there's a there's a bit of a dearth of allergists uh, nationally, uh, and it's in, it's particularly in certain areas. And then up until last year, there weren't any FDA approved treatments for food allergy. So, you know, it's not all that unreasonable for folks, like particularly adults who have been able to successfully avoid their allergen for years uh, to decide that it's simply not worth going and getting their allergies diagnosed. Um, so, so to estimate the prevalence of food allergy uh, without excluding these, these patients who never make it uh, into an allergist's office, uh, researchers like us have, have turned to surveys. And this is a review of uh, survey data that was collected from 1990 through 2010, shows how the rates of reported food allergy have increased substantially um, across the last few decades. Um, and, you know, while, you know, these estimates are mostly from population-based surveys like, like the National Health Interview Survey and, and Haynes, um, the ability of these kind of standard federal uh, surveillance systems to capture true cases of food allergy is pretty limited. Um, and mainly by the fact that, you know, for each survey, they only afford, you know, one or two questions to the assessment of food allergy. Um, and, the, and, and Haynes only surveys about 5,000 people a year, you know, so, you, so you're very limited in your ability to precisely estimate the prevalence of rare diseases. Um, not to mention the questions that are used have not been particularly specific to IgE mediated food allergy. And so, um, you know, this kind of gets us to our first big challenge in, in population based research in the field of food allergy, which is, you know, how do we assess the prevalence of a rare disease um, when, you know, you used to do random digit dialing when people had landlines and picked up their phone. Um, another option would be to to leverage population based survey research panels, uh, you know, who, that are nationally representative, but but there don't currently aren't any that are big enough to, uh, you know, precisely estimate the prevalence of um, diseases as rare, relatively speaking, as specific food allergies. And so uh, one solution that, that our group has found useful is what we call a dual sample approach, where we augment a nationally representative survey research panel with high quality web-based non-probability sample so that we can get a large sample, uh, a large enough sample to do a precise subgroup estimation, you know, in different demographic strata, um, while preserving our ability to draw population level inferences um, by leveraging uh, a national uh, sample that is uh, high quality. And so, uh, for example, in our, our last effort to estimate the prevalence of food allergy we conducted a few years ago, uh, we also assessed the prevalence of other, you know, rare allergic uh, diseases in the U.S., um, like f -PICE and EOE. And this schematic shows how we augmented data that we collected from over 7,000 households who were a part of uh, NORC at the University of Chicago's AmeriSpeak panel, uh, which they have recruited using really rigorous methods um, comparable to the U.S. Census, which includes, you know, unconditional incentives, face-to-face follow-up. Um, so we have this nice sample uh, it's basically a market research panel but but recruited via very uh, very high quality methods and then we administered a survey to them and then we augmented that data with non-probability sample from uh, another uh, survey research organization and ended up with data on uh, nearly 80,000 US children and adults and so then I won't get too into the weeds here but we applied uh, you know some approaches, calibration weighting, small area estimation, um, which treat this Amerispeak panel as a, kind of our ground truth, a relatively unbiased estimate. Um, and because we can leverage information on the people who respond to our survey and don't respond to our survey, um, we're able to weight that uh, for non-response and other potential biases, and then use you know, this sort of ground truth to bias correct the additional sample we get from SSI within um, 48 different uh, demographic strata. And then we combine the samples, apply weights, and analyze the data. So it's, a, in a sense, kind of the best of both worlds. And that's how we've gotten around the uh, challenge of you know, getting a large enough population-based sample to do prevalence estimation in the context of food allergy. And so that's obviously not the only challenge to doing this work. Another big challenge is, as I mentioned before, how do we accurately and reliably 
determine food allergy prevalence um, without requiring physician confirmation of disease. You know, often when, you know, for asthma, you ask about wheeze, you ask about, uh, you know, has a physician ever told you you have asthma and you can be fairly confident you're getting, um, you know, most of the cases of asthma in a population. That's just not the case with food allergy. Um, and so uh, the way that we've gone about trying to solve that issue is by working with an expert panel of allergists and developing a, a diagnostic algorithm that uh, creates three separate case definitions um, for food allergy, like using increasingly stringent criteria. So, you know, first we characterize folks who just who report a current food allergy, and that's it. They they are considered to have reported food allergy, and we acknowledge that that is uh, likely a, a pretty substantial overestimate of the true prevalence of food allergy. Um, but nevertheless, those are people who consider themselves to be living with a food allergy and are probably suffering some sort of psychosocial impairment or um, at least, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not nothing that they think they have a food allergy, even if that's a, a wild over uh, estimate of the prevalence. Then in our survey, we ask about the specific reaction symptoms um, that participants reported during their most severe food allergic reaction. And then we attempt to rule out, you know, likely intolerances, things like oral allergy syndrome, pollen food allergy syndrome, and other non-IgE mediated allergies. And so people who report a food allergy and then have a, what we call a convincingly IgE mediated uh, reaction history, they are our uh, population of convincingly food allergic people. And then the subset of those folks who report that they had their allergy diagnosed via some sort of confirmatory testing, they are our, you know, physician confirmed food allergy cases. Um, and we uh, think that is, you know, probably an underestimate of the true population level burden of food allergy. And so after going through all that, um, we ended up with an estimate of the current burden of food allergy, IG mediated food allergy in the US of around one in 10 adults and about one in 13 kids. And, uh, you know, they exhibited, you know, from, from very mild but nevertheless convincing uh, clinical histories to very severe, uh, potentially life-threatening anaphylactic histories. And so that corresponds to um, over 32 million people in the US, which is a lot of folks. Um, here we see the, you know, those three case definitions, and these are the prevalence of uh, specific food allergies. And so you can see here, um, kind of, this is in among U.S. children, you know, ages uh, zero to seventeen, and so we see here that um, you know, if we focus on the purple estimates, which we think are the most uh, accurate assessment of the population level burden of food allergy, we see that peanut is the most common food allergy, um, affecting a little over two percent of, of U.S. kids, followed by milk, shellfish, tree nuts, egg, finfish, wheat, and soy. Um, and we also estimated, uh, you know, sesame. Um, and so these eight have been typically considered to be the top eight food allergies. Um, but we, uh, you know, we're now, or the big eight, um, sesame is, uh, appears to be also um, a little less prevalent than soy, but, but, but still fairly common. Um, and so overall, we've got 11.4% of kids with a reported food allergy, 7.6% with a convincing food allergy, and 4.7% uh, with a physician confirmed um, convincing food allergy. Now looking at adults, uh, we see this is a uh, same order and kind of go back and forth and see not a whole lot of difference in the um, burden of disease among, of specific food allergies among US adults, but there are a few notable differences. Namely, a lot of adults report milk allergy, but only report mild GI symptoms, which we do not take to be you know, indicative of a real IgE mediated food allergy. Um, and you also see a lot more shellfish allergy and finfish allergy, uh, but mainly just a, a heck of a lot of shellfish allergy. Um, but in general, the, uh, you know, the, the, the relative prevalence of the remaining allergies appears to be pretty similar. And uh, on the topic of sesame, one kind of cool sidebar here is that uh, the last few years we've been working with FDA um, to provide them with estimates of the prevalence and severity of sesame allergy, um, which they have been considering, you know, regulating alongside other major allergens for, for the last few years. And so they uh, published a paper a couple years ago or last year in, in JAMA Network Open 
um, which uh, was a key input to their decision making um, that eventually led to the development and passage of, of a bipartisan FASTER Act in Congress, uh, which was signed into, into law by President Biden, uh, which was pretty cool uh, to, be, to be a part of. And now moving on to, uh, you know, this is again, the same top nine food allergies, but here we see the age distribution. And so the, here we get some insights into the natural history of specific food allergies across childhood. And so if you look at these uh, light blue bars on the left, you can see how peanut, you know, milk and egg are the most common allergies uh, encountered early in infancy, um, but they have different trajectories. You know, so while, while you see peanut like kind of plateauing here around two, two and a half percent prevalence um, after age one, um, that, you know, that suggests that it, it is, you know, relatively infrequently outgrown. In contrast, we see milk, which is very common early in infancy, but then, you know, tends to resolve. Same with egg and soy. Um, we see tree nut allergy and shellfish allergy increasing in prevalence, specifically shellfish allergy, um, you know, and which, you know, like peanut, these tend to be more persistent and less frequently outgrown. Um, so even though these are cross-sectional data, we do get some insights into the kind of longitudinal um, trajectories of some of these, some of these diseases or some of these specific allergies. And these are the same data as the previous slide, um, but I just superimposed some age-specific estimates, um, you know, in comparable age groups from uh, well-designed birth cohorts uh, around the world, you know, such as, you know, the European uh, Europreval study, the Irish baseline study, the Isle of Wight birth cohort, um, as well as Australian uh, health nuts, uh, which wasn't a birth cohort, but they were recruited, uh, I believe, at two, two or four months of age. And so, uh, so we can kind of get a little, because these estimates are, are actually quite comparable, even though they're um, gleaned through, through very different methods, and all the, most of these other studies employ clinical confirmation of disease, this does give us some confidence that, that our uh, you know, convincing definition of, uh, or ca case definition, is, uh, is valid um, or at least comparable to, to some of these clinical uh, outcomes. So now kind of switching to adults, one of the big findings from uh, these recent uh, epidemiological data that we've been collecting is a very high rate of report of adult onset food allergy, um, which uh, admittedly surprised us a bit. And here you can see these are the top eight um, and you can kind of see by age, the y-axis here, this is the, the you know, allergy specific prevalence um, of each of these allergies. The orange reflects you know, kind of the proportion of cases that are given in a given age strata that are childhood onset um, versus adult onset. And so you can see here, shellfish allergy, very, uh, you know, a little more than half the cases of shellfish allergy among adults are, are adult onset shellfish allergy. Um, same thing with, with milk and, and wheat. Uh, so, whereas peanut appears to be, you know, mostly developed in childhood and kind of persisting through through adulthood, um, so this is a, this is an interesting an interesting finding that was somewhat surprising. Obviously, we need a lot more work, um, as particularly we need some like longitudinal uh, data in adult cohorts. Um, but uh, but just thought I, I would share that um, because it, it, it's consistent with you know sort of clinical case reports and observations, but it's the first time that, that it's been kind of widely uh, reported. And here we see, you know, as I mentioned before, um, a pillar of successful food allergy management is um, having access to epinephrine, an epinephrine auto injector, and knowing how and when to use it. And so here we see kind of across uh, the entire, uh, you know, lifespan, the percent of the U.S. population who have a convincing food allergy who report a current epinephrine auto injector prescription, you know, among those with convincing food allergy, physician confirmed food allergy, and physician confirmed food allergy with, uh, you know, one or more uh, emergency department visits relating to food allergy. And so we see here that, you know, certainly, definitely among adults, there's a tendency to, uh, to not, not have a current epinephrine prescription, which, which potentially means these patients are at risk. Of, uh, of anaphylaxis and, and in any event uh, this uh, you know we, we would hope that you know if food allergies are being appropriately managed at the population level you would see a lot more patients um, in all of these groups with a current epinephrine auto injector uh, prescription and so um, another you know so adult onset was a bit of a surprise another thing that that we 
uh, learned a lot about through this epidemiological study was the relative uh, you know, abundance of multi-food allergies. And so um, one of the, so we found that basically uh, you know, somewhere between a third to a half of um, child, US children who have food allergy actually have more than one food allergy. Um, so, you know, the idea of like, what are, what, you know, what food are you allergic to? You know, in a lot of cases, it's what, which foods are you allergic to? And that was the same uh, finding in, uh, in adults who, who had even higher rates of multi-food allergy. And so, you know, here, you know, uh, on average, you know, of, of uh, all food allergic children, you know, the average child had about two allergies um, and among multi-food allergic children, they had an average of about uh, four allergies. And so, um, and this is treating, you know, specific shellfish allergies, specific tree nut allergies, specific fin fish allergies, um, you know, as, as separate. Um, same thing with adults, although with adults, you see uh, a tendency, a kind of a, a decline in the frequency of, of having multi-food allergy across the lifespan. Um, to look at this a different way, you know, we focus so much on peanut, but these data suggest that, you know, among people in the US with food allergy, you know, regardless of which case definition we use, fewer than 15% of people in the US who have a food allergy are only allergic to peanut. And this is an issue because, you know, current NIAID sponsored prevention, food allergy prevention guidelines, and the only FDA approved treatment for food allergy, they exclusively target pediatric peanut allergy. And so we, we just, we need to move beyond peanut um, to really capture um, this full uh, burden of disease. And so another thing, um, oh wait, whoops here, go back a little bit. This is just showing that, you know, as the number of uh, food allergies, of convincing food allergies that patients have increases, so does their uh, risk of experiencing a number of, uh, you know, kind of negative food allergy related outcomes, including reporting having one or more, you know, ED visits, relating to their food allergy in the last year, in their lifetime, frequency of reporting a uh, severe reaction history. Um, thankfully, their likelihood of reporting a current epinephrine auto-injector prescription increases, but so does their report of uh, using it to treat a food allergic reaction, which is uh, an indicator, albeit an imperfect one, of, of uh, having a severe reaction. And this is among US children, very similar findings among adults. Um, we'll color uh, here. So this is um, a, a heat map showing, you know, to what extent certain top nine food allergies co-occur. You know, so these are conditional uh, probabilities or percentages um, showing, you know, the percent of children who are, or percent of adults down here um, who have a given allergy up here who are also allergic to the allergen like in the row. So, you know, 61% of uh, kids who have a tree nut allergy are also allergic to peanut, you know, and you see similar findings, uh, you know, with uh, in the adult and the pediatric population. And, and I'm just present this briefly, I could talk about this for like an hour, but um, just to, to point out that it's not random uh, how these uh, multi allergies, uh, you know, are distributed. You know, these nut allergies tend to co-occur with, with peanut, We've got, uh, and often with sesame as well, um, milk and egg tend to co-occur um, as do these uh, specific seafood allergens. And uh, again, while these are only focusing on these kind of top nine classes of food allergies, it's important to note that you can be allergic to specific fin fish, you know, shellfish and or tree nuts and, and not allergic to others. You know, so here's data from a, from a Stanford study um, that clinically evaluated 60 patients um, with multiple food allergies and found very high rates of co-allergy um, between cashew and pistachio, as well as frequent cross-reactivity uh, between pecan and walnut um, and, and hazelnut to a lesser extent. And this is attributed to, to the fact that they share a similar uh, protein structure. And so shifting gears a bit, um, another thing that we've come to understand in, in our investigation of the population level burden of food allergy is that its prevalence and uh, outcomes are not equitably distributed. And in fact, you know, like atopic dermatitis and asthma, 
uh, the burden of food allergy appears to fall disproportionately on certain racial ethnic minority groups, and that's particularly Black Americans uh, relative to their white counterparts. And so unfortunately, this, this really shouldn't be news to people because there's data as far back for, as 2002. Um, you know, this is a uh, show, showing this to be the case. And so this is a random digit dial survey um, by our colleague at uh, Mount Sinai, Scott Schischerer, um, which he conducted, you know, back when people had landlines, uh, didn't have color ID and answered their phones so he could get a 68% participation rate in his survey. Um, but here he found that, that rates of allergy to finfish um, were, were three times more common among Black Americans uh, than white Americans. And uh, shellfish allergy was more than twice as common. And a few years later, uh, data from N. Haynes found similar patterns uh, when looking at the outcome of any food allergy, um, not just seafood. Um, the, the CDC's uh, N. Haynes, the uh, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey uh, is neat because it combines interviews with physical exams um, or questionnaires with, with uh, physical examinations. And, and back in, uh, way back in 2005, 2006 is the last, and I believe only time that they um, collected blood and analyze specific IgEs to, to certain foods um, on a subset. And they found that, that rates of uh, allergic sensitization to shrimp and peanut uh, were considerably higher among um, Black and Hispanic Americans relative to non-Hispanic um, whites in the US. And so, and, and you can use these 99.5% predictive values to determine um, you know, which of these cases rose beyond sensitization and is likely to be clinically reactive. And that's who the likely food allergy um, folks are here. I mentioned before that food allergy fatalities are rare. Um, and, and this analysis found that, that while overall fatality rates did not increase from 1999 to 2010, they more than tripled among African-American males across this period. Um, and they also indicate that you know, African-American girls are twice as likely and African-American boys are three times as likely to suffer a fatal food-induced anaphylaxis um, compared to their white peers. And so um, you know, while these data are a bit old, we don't know the, the trends over the past decade, but in any event, it's uh, extremely troubling. And so data we published a few years ago with our colleagues at Rush, and Cincinnati Children's uh, found that, that relative to, to their white counterparts, um, Black and Hispanic food allergy patients uh, were twice as likely to have a history of food-induced anaphylaxis and uh, food allergy-related emergency department visits. Um, and they were also more likely to report specific uh, atopic comorbidities, particularly eczema, um, and also had a significantly shorter duration of uh, specialist follow-up care. Um, and this indicates potential disparities in access to allergy care. And so, you know, given all this context, another goal of, uh, of this latest prevalence uh, survey that we administered was, was to try to understand the current racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic differences in the burden of food allergy, uh, which, is, which is what I'm going to present right here. And so here we can see how, you know, very consistent with past work, um, you know, non-Hispanic Black Americans had the highest rates of reported, convincing, and physician-confirmed food allergy compared to other groups um, and Americans uh, identifying as Hispanic also reported elevated rates. Um, and these uh, findings were similar, uh, sorry, these are just in kids, but the findings were similar in, in adults as well. And so again, I'm breaking it down by specific food. And these are food specific estimates of uh, this convincing food allergy prevalence estimate among the entire US population, pediatric and adult. And here we can see um, you know, pretty substantial racial ethnic heterogeneity across the major food allergies. And so we can see how peanut, tree nut, egg, shellfish, and uh, finfish allergies are actually considerably less prevalent among non-Hispanic white Americans uh, relative to their black, Asian, and Hispanic counterparts. Um, cow's milk allergy is also uh, most common among uh, black, Hispanic, and uh, multiracial patients. Uh, we also found differences in the frequency of multi-food allergy uh, with uh, you know, non-Hispanic Black Americans having the highest rates of multi-food allergy. Um, black and Hispanic patients have the highest rates of uh, lifetime food allergy related emergency depart visit, department visits. Um, and among kids, um, Black uh, children have uh, higher rates of um, having reported use of epinephrine to treat a, uh, a severe food allergic reaction. 
um, while reporting comparable rates of uh, having a current epinephrine prescription. So um, just to kind of summarize, you know, the, the current data from us and a bunch of other uh, sources suggests that you know, food allergic sensitization is more common among Black versus white Americans. Food allergy is more prevalent among Black and white Americans um, versus white Americans, uh, particularly seafood allergy, but, but also most other major allergies as well. Um, and outcomes are more severe. And I, I bring this up because you know, if, if you work in this field or, or, or kind of adjacent to this field, you, you hear kind of just this undercurrent of uh, this idea that food allergy disproportionately affects affluent people or white people. And, and it's kind of this like affluent, this disease of the affluent. And it's just the data are so clear that that is not the case. Um, and, uh, and I think we just, we need to get this message out so that we can uh, have more equity in the food allergy outcomes. And so, you know, zooming out a little bit, you know, why do we think these observed differences in allergy prevalence exist? And then of course, you know, what can we do to, to you know, prevent them? <laughs> um, and so emerging data suggests uh, that food allergy can arise due to a whole bunch of factors um, which can act alone or in concert. And there's similar determinants uh, to those for asthma and eczema and other atopic conditions. Uh, we know these can include air pollution exposure, um, inflammation, alterations in the specific um, you know, microbiome, um, you know, relative abundance of, of certain bacteria like Staph aureus on the skin, um, as well as you know, kind of inherent genetic predisposition. Although there's also some evidence that there might be epigenetic factors that play a role. Um, but of these, perhaps the best studied and the most amenable to intervention is uh, you know, the timing, dose, format, and diversity of common food allergens in our diet. And so that's what I'm going to get into right here. And so with respect to kind of dietary intake of food allergens or dietary exposure to food allergens early in life, which we believe to be a critical period for, um, you know, the development of, of oral tolerance or allergy, um, a recent finding from a survey we conducted earlier this year uh, Nash, of a national sample um, recruited through the same kind of methods I, I outlined earlier of over 3,000 parents and caregivers of U.S. infants we found substantial differences in the reported timing of peanut introduction. You know, with uh, you know half of white parents reporting um, introducing peanut protein to their infants, you know, during the uh, first year of life, uh, relative to about you know forty percent of black and thirty five percent of Hispanic and Asian patients or parents. Sorry, um, and uh, we also observed a, a pattern where you know infants from higher earning households and infants from Households with greater levels of parental education were more likely to introduce peanut earlier in infancy, um, indicating that you know these the current recommendations, uh, which have been made by major major uh, institutions organizations, uh, which advocate introducing peanut during the first year of life and ideally around six months, um, are not being equitably disseminated. And and a broader point is that you know even among the most socially advantaged families. The majority of parents are still not introducing peanut during the first year of life, and fewer than a quarter are introducing it during uh, by six months, which is uh, you know kind of what the current consensus guidelines uh, advocate. So why might this be? Um, we recently presented these data at the um, annual meeting of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and these show that that fewer than two and three parents reported that their uh, primary care provider discussed peanut introduction with them. And of these, fewer than 40% reported that their primary care provider advised them to introduce peanut um, during the first year of life. And very few uh, were aware of these um, you know, 2017 guidelines, particularly targeted to, ki to kids or to parents of children with eczema um, advocating uh, early introduction of peanut. So um, these, these are not being implemented. And now zooming even further out, you might wonder why is he going on and on about feeding babies peanut? I haven't even really made the case for why this is important, um, particularly when, you know, maybe when you were in med school or, or uh, in just a couple short decades ago, the AAP issued infant feeding guidelines instructing parents to delay peanut feeding until age three, saying that these infants you know, their guts just weren't ready to handle peanut. And that's why we are seeing all these cases of peanut allergy. And so 
Um, you know, arguably the first you know, major insights into the importance of early introduction of allergenic solids you know, came from this epidemiological study, um, which found huge differences in peanut allergy prevalence between um, Jewish infants raised in the UK versus Jewish infants raised in Israel. And so it turns out that in Israel, infants are commonly weaned with a, a puffed peanut containing snack called bamba. Um, can't say I recommend it, it's okay. Um, while uh, <laughs> it's for good babies love it. Um, but in the UK, uh, infant exposure to, to peanut protein, you know, generally occurred later in childhood. And so, you know, it was hypothesized that this kind of systematic earlier introduction of peanut into the Israeli infant's diet um, was driving this tenfold unadjusted relative risk of peanut allergy. Um, and indeed, even after uh, adjusting for atopy, age, sex, and the presence of other food allergies, um, these British infants were still more than five times um, as likely to develop peanut allergy compared to their Israeli um, counterparts. And you can see the specificity to peanut because after adjustment for um, these factors, the, the risk of egg and, and milk um, allergy are, are attenuated substantially. And these epidemiological findings spurred the LEAP study, uh, which was an RCT specifically designed to test the hypothesis that you know, early frequent consumption of peanut in high-risk infants starting between four and 11 months of age is protective against food allergy. And so this study was, took place in the UK uh, by the same investigators who conducted that um, epidemiological study, randomly assigned 640 infants with severe eczema, egg allergy, or both, you know, a high-risk group, um, to consume or avoid peanuts until 60 months of age. Um, babies were skin prick tested to see if they already had a peanut allergy, and then only babies who were not sensitized or had a small, uh, you know, amount of sensitization uh, were, were included. They were then randomized, you know, within those, uh, those strata. And in the intervention group, parents were encouraged to feed their kids bamba, you know, with three or more meals a week so that the kids ate six or six grams of peanut protein a week, beginning between four and 11 months of age. Um, in contrast, the controls were told not to feed their infant peanut containing foods until they turned five. Um, and then when they turned 60 months of age, they evaluated the kids for peanut allergy. There was a really good retention rate, you know, 98% and, and excellent adherence to the study diets. And so you can see here, you know, whether or not the patients were sensitized to peanut at enrollment, um, there was a very strong preventive effect of early peanut consumption. And this was even stronger in the per protocol analysis. And there also, there was no between group difference in, in you know, serious adverse events or the effectiveness of the intervention, which is awesome. Um, and so, you know, the, the rigor of the trial combined with, you know, this huge risk reduction they observed um, led to the rapid development of uh, addendum guidelines here in the US by, that was sponsored by NIAID for the prevention of peanut allergy. Um, those were published in, uh, in 2015, um, or sorry, 2017. Um, and, and these guidelines, you know, which currently remain in effect, you know, advocate you know, a shift towards earlier introduction, um, but targeted to kids uh, with eczema. Um, they do not specifically recommend, um, you know, earlier, early introduction uh, for, you know, the majority of kids who, um, you know, are, are at quote unquote, you know, normal risk of food allergy. And so, you know, you might wonder why, you know, we, we care so much about eczema in these guidelines and why we've talked about eczema throughout the talk. Uh, and that's because eczema is a crucial risk factor for food allergy, you know, and that, you know, specifically, you know, an impaled or uh, an impaired Epithelial barrier um, renders it more likely that the infant's immune system receives its first exposure to an allergen um, like peanut protein, like through the skin, as opposed to the gut. You know, we evolved to eat food, not not rub it on our arms, um, and that actually cutaneous allergen exposure can initiate this allergic cascade that leads to a Th2 skewed pro-inflammatory immune response, um, and then eventually we believe allergy. You know, in contrast, you know, we have a well-evolved system for promoting tolerogenic immune responses to allergens that we first encounter through the gut. And so that's why if you have eczema, you know, your skin barrier is impaired, much more likely to receive that first exposure through your skin and why it's important to kind of beat the, the, you know, get the gut route to beat the skin route um, by encouraging uh, oral exposure to these allergens early in life. And so, you know, that's, so the LEAP study taught us about high-risk kids. Then there was a follow-up study 
um, that it recruited a general population sample of exclusively breastfed kids from uh, or infants from England and Wales, and had two groups. The, the control group or standard introduction group was just a, they followed the standard UK government advice and were asked to exclusively breastfeed for around six months and then introduce allergenic foods you know, per parental choice. Um, but the intervention group in this EAT study was asked to introduce six allergenic foods from the age of three months. Um, parents, you know, they started with baby rice and then pureed like fruit or vegetables, then some cow's milk based yogurts um, while they continued breastfeeding. And then the parents were instructed to introduce fish, egg, milk, sesame, and peanut, you know, kind of in a random order with two new foods a week. Uh, and then the goal was to feed each food twice weekly um, by five months of age, in addition to, to breastfeeding. And so um, they evaluated these kids uh, between one and three years of age. Um, and they did find that the food allergy, the rates of food allergy were lower um, in the group that was introduced early. Um, but, you know, this 20% risk reduction was not statistically significant, you know, in the intent to treat analysis, um, you know, because unfortunately, in contrast to LEAP, which observed higher rates of adherence to the study diet, participants in the EAT study had a lot of trouble adhering to the assigned intervention. Um, particularly those assigned to the early introduction group, you know, where there are fewer than one in three were adherent. And so, uh, however, you know, all is not lost. The study did find that the people who actually adhered to the study diet um, had a strong 67% uh, reduction in allergy to one or more foods, and then a, uh, a strong uh, preventive effect for, for peanut as well. So replicating LEAP in a general population sample, um, but Unfortunately, you know, it, it did not kind of achieve the main outcome of this intent to treat. Um, but it did find that it was safe to introduce the allergens that, that early in the general population and that it didn't interfere with breastfeeding. And there's sort of a flip side of, of the poor adherence, which is that, you know, compared to LEAP, where everybody just did what they were supposed to, um, in EAT, you know, because of that variability in adherence, we could draw some inference, or not we, uh, George Dutrois and Gideon and their group uh, in, at Imperial College London uh, were able to um, draw some conclusions around, um, you know, weekly average allergen dose response, um, you know, in terms of, you know, how do we really need six grams of protein a week to get this intervention, of, to this strong prevention effect, or can we feed less, um, which gets important if you're talking about introducing a whole bunch of foods early in life, and, you know, maybe you have you know, kids with no allergies, but they're all obese because you're, you know, pumping them full of, you know, nine different kinds of nut butters and stuff. Um, so, so they did find that um, even smaller quantities, or the data are highly suggestive that, you know, even smaller quantities of allergenic solids, particularly peanut and egg, um, if fed regularly and early enough, this can induce a tolerogenic immune response. Um, but to date, there hasn't been much work since LEAP, uh, looking at the effectiveness of, of uh, kind of multi-food allergy prevention and nothing in the US. Enter the CAN-DO study, which is what Ruchi and I have been spending a lot of our time working on um, the, past, uh, the past year. And uh, this is a study which uh, we are um, recruiting this month, uh, where we are aiming to see, you know, whether the consistent feeding of eight in key food allergens starting around four months of age reduces the prevalence of allergy um, to one or more of these foods by 12 months. Um, and, and along with this primary aim are a wide variety of secondary and ancillary studies because this is going to be an exceptionally well-characterized um, you know, cohort. And we are uh, aiming to kind of solve some of the problems that um, EAT had by providing extensive support to families uh, who are you know, randomized to the intervention group giving them, you know, got nutrition counseling, giving them the foods, giving them the foods in a bunch of different formats that are uh, super friendly, giving a lot of uh, educational materials. Um, but anyway, I could go on and on about, about the CANDU study, um, but I should probably wrap up because I see we have some questions and uh, I think I've been talking long enough. But um, before I, I guess I, before Richie handles the questions, um, I do want to just give a shout out to everybody at CIFAR and all of our collaborators across the country, around the world, um, and particularly Ruchi for recruiting me back to Northwestern. I couldn't be happier in my new role. Um, 
you know, at, at, uh, at CIFAR. And um, if folks want to connect with us and follow all the work we're doing, um, we've got a lot of a lot of resources online and our social media handles are here. So I'll turn it over to, to Ruchi. Thank you, Chris, for that absolutely excellent talk. Uh, I want to encourage everyone who has been listening to please enter questions uh, in the Q&A button on your screen on the bottom. I forgot to mention that in the beginning, but please do ask Chris questions. We have two uh, that I'm going to pose to you. These are big ones, so it could take a whole nother talk, but, and you did go over this first one, I think after this question was asked, but if you wanna answer it briefly again, um, it's what are the theories or evidence as to why prevalence is increasing? And maybe you could bring back up that slide, that beautiful slide you had where, uh, where you did go over this, but go ahead, Chris. Yeah, um, well, well, one sort of continuing in the like early introduction, you know, so, so assuming that one of the things we have evidence for is the importance of early exposure to these allergens. You know, one of the things that we, we know was not helpful in terms of, uh, you know, stopping the, the increase was um, you know this this recommendation that was made in the year 2000 to when the first kind of batch of convincing epidemiological data showing that peanut allergy prevalence in particular, um, but also all the other major food allergens, you know, like uh, like dairy, egg, tree nuts were on the rise. The there was a, a guideline uh, consensus driven guideline made in 2000 that actually said. We're scared that that part of this might be due to you know insufficient development of the gut um, to handle this these these allergens, and so it's best to delay introduction. Um, and so they actually uh, specifically recommended that that peanut introduction be delayed until you know three years. And so we know that you know there are all sorts of fact you know environmental factors relating to you know our the food we eat. You know the fact that you know there are there is we know that we need diverse immune inputs you know to 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 develop tolerance and you know our environment has changed so much in the past 50 years um, that there was already this sort of trend towards increased allergy um, the these guidelines that then explicitly kind of tried to keep parents from feeding their kids these allergenic solids um, was something that we we think kind of catalyze the increase that we've seen particularly over the past um, two decades. But there are a whole host of factors and it's not just food allergies that are increasing. You know, there's this phenomenon called the, the atopic march where, you know, this, this immune dysregulation that the first indication of which, you know, is usually eczema. Um, but we know that if a kid has eczema, particularly um, poorly, uh, poorly treated, poorly managed eczema, they're at dramatically increased risk of having uh, developing a food allergy. Then they're at increased risk of developing allergic asthma, environmental allergies, and so on. So we're kind of seeing not just this, this epidemic of food allergy, but it, it's happening hand in hand with these other um, allergic conditions, which is why, you know, we've got all these drivers, you know, food allergy is just, just part of the, of the puzzle. Um, but, you know, so we think that the, the different, Chain also, you know, the skin barrier is the thing I highlighted. So that's another thing that, um, you know, the way that we, you know, bathe our babies, the products we use, um, the the fact that we live in this environment, you know, we're we're increasingly urbanized. We see huge differences between urban and rural populations in terms of the prevalence of food allergies, and and we think one of the contributors is increases in uh, traffic related air pollution and other, um, you know, basically like skin irritants that lead to to local and cutaneous inflammation, and then you know render that skin barrier less effective at um, you know doing what it's supposed to do, which is keep things out, uh, so that we can get these allergens in through the route that we know is most likely to promote immune tolerance, which is just eating them. <laughs> so again, like Richie said, we could go on and on, um, and we have a lot of other studies kind of looking a little more into the etiology, but. Uh, yeah. Guess, what next? Well, let me get to you a couple more. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so another question that came up is, uh, and I think this is for the can-do study, how will this study be implemented in communities that are less likely to expose their children to food allergies? And this is such a great question. Um, how do we be inclusive? And Chris, you want to talk about that? We've thought a lot about it. Sure. Well, I mean, and, and so I, they are our ideal population. You know, I think one of the things where we, we, we don't, if, if all of our sample comes from, from, you know, populations who are highly likely to already be introducing these food allergens, you know, we're shooting ourselves in the foot in terms of being able to detect a significant intervention effect. Um, and so, so we are really uh, being systematic about um, reaching out and trying to, you know, engage, you know, FQHCs. We've got a, a, net, a, a regional network um, that we are, are, we've been collaborating with on another NIH uh, funded project for a while. Um, we have a, a very, uh, I think, attractive incentive, um, you, know, you know, schedule. And, and we are really making sure that patients, our participants are, are amply compensated for, you know, Every survey they do, every biospecimen they provide, every visit they they uh, you know participate in, um, but more generally, you know we've we've got Spanish trained staff, we've got uh, really accessible, very well produced um, content, you know that is going to just really walk participants like hand in hand and help them introduce these foods in a variety of formats, you know not just kind of like the eat study where they said here's what you're supposed to do <laughs> go and do it well you know obviously they it was a good study but they they did not provide the study foods to the participants nor did they you know have a, a trained like nutritionist checking in with them and helping coach them through the process of introdu introducing those foods so that those are all lessons we learned from eat and from these previous uh, studies and so we we are really trying to um you know walk that fine line where we want to be be our participants kind of like best friend slash uh, support throughout the if they're randomizing the intervention group. And I do just want to add that this has been front and center for us. We want to have a diversity racially, ethnically, and economically in this study because yeah. um, that, you know, leap of course was the first one and you learn but we want to make sure that happens. And we're fortunate to live in a city like Chicago um, with other great um, institutions. We're partnering with U of C and Rush, and then of course the FQHCs and then practices all over Chicago. So we are hoping to get a very diverse sample. And, and that is really important to make sure that what we develop can work in all populations. Okay, a um, couple more questions. I don't know if we're gonna get to them all. Actually, we're at time, but they're so important to you because these are things we're doing. Are, are there similar studies looking at adult onset food allergy? So I thought that was just a, a fascinating question since there's not a ton of data on that. Yeah, I mean, so so again, I, I, that's kind of why I highlighted the need, the need for that. I think it's, it's, it's tricky. You know, we so so I guess this I could say we we have a cohort, um, this forward cohort, which started as a cohort of of, uh, you know, black and white families, you know, parent child dyads where the kids had food allergy um, at enrollment and we're following them to try to understand the natural history. Uh, we we got a supplement to, to also include a substantial popular like, proportion of Latinx um, participants. And now we just got a very good score on our renewal and it looks like we'll be funded for another five years where we can continue to follow these kids kind of through adolescence and uh, hopefully into young adulthood and some of the aims um, you know one of the key aims of this study because now we, we've been following these participants you know for for you know up to four years already um, you know including medical records biospecimens lots of surveys clinical visits annually um, as they enter adulthood um, we can see, you know, what factor, because we know if you have a food allergy, you're more likely to develop an adult, uh, an adult onset food allergy. So we have kind of a high risk sample cohort for the development of adult onset food allergy. Of course, we don't have any adults in this cohort yet, uh, but eventually they will be adults and we'll be able to, you know, start to learn about, you know, who, which types of patients are developing them. And then what is, what are kind of the 
the phenotypes and endotypes that, that are most associated with that. So besides this, I mean, there are there certainly are other cohorts, but they tend to really focus early in life, you know, so there's not a lot of adults and, and mainly that's just because the burden of disease hadn't really been demonstrated convincingly until pretty recently. Uh, and then, you know, it's okay, uh, I'm going to pause you, Chris, yeah. because we're at time. And I know so many people have stayed on. We have a couple more questions, but I did want to mention that in the chat are the future IFEM meetings, the ones coming up. So if you want to take a quick look at that, and then you can also subscribe um, to the weekly newsletter so you will get all this information. Um, uh, and if anyone needs to drop off, that's fine. Chris, if you have just a couple minutes, maybe sure. we can like very briefly hit these last two questions. Um, they're very, very interesting questions. So um, one of them is, what is the role of food manufacturing and food allergy? Societies with eating unaltered foods, do they have these same problems? Yeah, so that's that's a, a great question. And I, I yeah. don't consider myself an expert in, in this area, but I think that, you know, there have been, there have been some pretty convincing animal studies showing that you know some of these preservatives um, and emulsifiers can induce allergy or break oral tolerance you know in in rat models and and other kind of mammalian models that we know are pretty good um, at mimicking you know the 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 human immune system so uh you know if you just think about all of we have we evolved our immune system to deal with you know <laughs> are in tandem with our environment. And, you know, clearly one of the things that's changed the most in the last 50 years is, is our food environment and the, and the amount of processing in our foods. Um, I think that's an area where we just, we need to do so much more work to really figure out what is, what specific aspects of the processing, you know, um, we know that the way that protein, you know, for some things like peanut, you know, if you, if you roast peanut, it becomes, more allergenic, you know, whereas with, with milk and egg, if you heat it, they're heat labile proteins. So by heating it, heating those, it renders them less allergenic. So, you know, the form in which these foods are introduced, uh, you know, and the cultural differences in the, you know, the diets like that clearly plays a huge role. I got to think the way that, you know, if you think of manufacturing as just like one step further on the food preparation continuum, it surely uh, has an effect. We just it's hard to know exactly what effect and, and where the kind of lowest hanging fruit is for like these big, you know, the interventions that would bear population these health. These questions are pretty much a whole nother talk. <laughs> so really awesome questions, but um, yeah, we don't have the full answer, but to Chris's point, you know, there's so many variables leading to, yes, it is probably. And that's another, in, in the can do study, we are characterized, we are really well characterizing the, the infant diet. And so, you know, starting from the very first thing, mm -hmm. you know, they put in their bodies, we will have it very well documented. So uh, unfortunately these kids are on a normal developmental timeline. So we're going to have to wait for answers from that study, but they are forthcoming. Awesome. Okay. Last but not least, uh, any, and this is, this is very important. Um, the world is small, but any intention of conducting an international study to account for the environmental variables? Yeah. I mean, so, you know, the answer to this, Richie, because we've yeah. been working <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> our colleagues in, in, uh, different regions of India, um, because, you know, there, there's, it's interesting. One of the, so I, I alluded to some data from this Health Nuts cohort in Australia, um, which was the first cohorts population-based cohort study to to employ really rigorous, you know, clinical confirmation of food allergy at at one year, and they've been following up with these kids um, through age ten now, um, and found you know very very high rates of allergies to some of these common foods in a in a general population cohort around Melbourne, Australia. But one of the really really impactful findings from that cohort is that children, you know, so there's a lot of Asian migrants or immigrants in Australia. Um, when uh, folks immigrate from places like India, Pakistan, um, they don't develop new allergies, but when they have kids, their kids have very high rates of uh, food allergy, which, you know, means undoubtedly there, there's some sort of, you know, gene by environment interaction going on. 
And so kind of building off of that, we've been slowly developing this research network in, uh, in the US, India, and, uh, and in the UK to try to start looking at these things more systematically. Um, and uh, you know, we keep trying to get uh, NIH funding for it. Aren't quite there yet, but we've got other funding sources and have been proving that we can collect high quality data in urban, you know, sub kind of exurban and rural context, which I think is gonna be really compelling, hopefully to uh, reviewers soon so we can spin it up uh, in, a, in a real meaningful way. Cause that's really the only way to answer these questions. All right. And with that, um, we will end the seminar series for today. Thanks again, Chris. Thanks Adela for all your hard work putting this together. And uh, thanks for all the participants who are still hanging out. Uh, thank you so much for participating and see you next time. Yep. Thanks, Richie. Thanks, everybody. Bye.